uh, for the invitation and uh, uh, let me start. So I'm going to speak about uh, the Singer conjecture in dimension three. Now this is gonna be revisited and its extensions. Okay, uh, so as I mentioned in the abstract, uh, this is a joint work with Mike Hall, uh, NC State and uh, Mark Stern at Duke. And I have to say that everything I'm gonna uh, present today is an application of a theory which I have been developing with Mark Stern since 2017. So this is gonna be an application, uh, hopefully interesting to you guys, an application of a theory uh, developed uh, with M. Stern uh, starting in 2017, okay? And this is ongoing. So um, I would say let's start with the statement of the Singer conjecture. So what is the Singer conjecture? Um, so if I take an n-dimensional Riemannian manifold, and for us, the manifold will always be uh, closed, so compact without boundary and orientable. And I'm gonna add a topological assumption, namely that it's gonna be a spherical. Then the single conjecture is a vanishing uh, statement for the L2 Betty numbers of this manifold. So then Singer conjectured in the, um, I think in the 70s, that the L2 Betty numbers of M are always zero for the index of the Betty number different from the middle dimension, okay? So this is the uh, statement of this conjecture. Now let me try to uh, tell you what. So a spherical means that if you take the uh, universal cover, let's say uh, from M tilde to M, then the total space M tilde is contractible. It's contractible. Okay. So in particular, if you if you think, for example, of torus, the universal cover is R n, and that's an example of an atmospherical manifold. Now I have to to give you um, a definition for the L two Betty numbers. Now here it is. It might be a little bit complicated, but I'm gonna translate it in very elementary terms in just one second. So if you bear with me, you will see uh, the light at the end of the tunnel very soon. So what does what are these L2 invariants called L2 Betty numbers? So these are defined as the uh, von Neumann dimension of the gamma module of L2 integrable K uh, harmonic forms on the universal cover of M. So let me just say this. And here I have to tell you where I consider now the Riemannian universal cover. So I have M G. So by this, that simply means that pi is nothing else than the topological universal cover and the G tilde is nothing else than the pullback of the metric on the base manifold. And <clears throat> what is this Hilbert space of L2 harmonic K forms on M tilde? Here, this Hilbert space is nothing else. So here I'm gonna define the, uh, oh, and sorry. This index here has to be I, the same as the I, the I Betty number. So, what is the space H2I of M tilde is nothing else that the omegas in the space of I form on the universal cover such that they are in the uh, kernel of the Hodge Laplacian. And moreover, they have an L2 condition, uh, an L2 growth condition, namely that if I take their L2 norm, and the L2 norm is simply, maybe I'll express it this way. If you take omega wedge, the star of omega 
then you get something of finite L2 energy. Okay, so this Laplacian here is the Laplacian on I form. And so this is gonna be D, D star plus uh, D star D, okay? So in particular, this, uh, in order to define this Laplacian, you need the metric, okay? Can I have a quick question? So, so, so uh, ju just to confirm, so, so these are always smooth forms, right? Yes. Because uh, by elliptic because regularity, of, if you wish. And, and then yeah. the question is, so, so, does any, so, so does any of this make sense for compact? Oh, no, university cover is never compact. Okay, got it. For a second, I thought that the integral was on M. Okay. Yeah, and, no, it's on M tilde, yes. And then... And, and notice, and, yeah, notice, sorry, notice that uh, since I'm assuming that the base manifold is a spherical, the yeah. universal cover is always not compact. Got it, got it. And, and the last quick question, you said von Neumann dimension. Could you- Yes, uh, I am, I am I'm giving, I'm giving, yes, I'm, I'm getting there. Okay, So notice, notice that here I have this gamma here. So that gamma there comes from the way these objects are defined, namely that, so you have this contractible universal cover, your base manifold NM can be expressed as a quotient by an infinite group of isometry acting on the universal cover. So, and then you have M tilde. So there is a way, uh, and this was defined by idea. So you have in principle, the Hilbert space of L2 harmonic I form on the universal cover. This might be a Hilbert space, might be infinite dimensional, but what happened is that you can define this phenomenon dimension where you take this quotient by this very, very big group and you get always a real number which Atiyah called the L2 Betty numbers, and this real number is, is always finite, okay? So you can arrange this with uh, some, it will take probably half an hour to go through all the functional analysis, but you can always do that. And this number here, which is this quotient of this potentially infinite Hilbert space, but you're taking a quotient by an infinite group, this thing always exists and is finite and real. Now, so this guy here is the guy acting on these Hilbert spaces. Now, though, it's not terribly important that uh, you go through all of this because of the following fact. If you look at a single conjecture, they say that these objects, which are complicated to define and they require some functional analysis, they always have to be zero. And now you understand that uh, it's reasonably intuitive to believe that these objects are gonna be zero if and only if the Hilbert space is zero itself. And so I could have rephrased the single conjecture by saying, if I take a closed spherical manifold MN, I pull back the metric to the universal color. I look at the L2 harmonic I form in degree outside the middle dimension, I have none of them, okay? So now the fact which will simplify things for us is that bi2 of m is actually equal to zero if and only if the space of L2 harmonic i form on the universal cover is a vector space, the empty vector space, okay? So now you see this is a, a really uh, easy now statement in geometric analysis. So this is telling you that if you take a closed spherical manifold, you look at the uh, L2 harmonic forms in the universal cover, they should not exist unless you're in middle dimension. Okay, it's very clean statement, very easy to state. The bad news, uh, maybe before I do that, let me also remark that one can show that these objects, which in principle are defined by using a metric on the base and pulling them back, they're actually homotopy invariant. So remark, the bi2 m are actually homotopy invariant. Homotopy invariant. And this is due to Atia and Dodzuk. Okay. Um, so Single conjecture, close as spherical, you don't have L2 harmonic height form on the universal cover uh, with a pullback metric unless you are in middle dimension. Are there any questions? 
I guess what, what fails here is basically all, all the time, what fails is the L2 condition. Sorry? Uh, uh, so this is, I guess this is more of, more of a comment. I just want to make sure I'm following. So what fails in this, why, uh, I guess there are usually a lot of harmonic forms, but that's, uh, that's correct. none of them are integrable. Basically. Yes. For yeah. example, on negative curve spaces, you can, uh, on the universal cover, for example, the hyperbolic space, you could have bounded harmonic uh, forms, but your bounded harmonic form now is not going to have an integral, which is an L2, because this underlying space is huge, okay? It has a lot yeah. of magic, okay? So here are the harmonic forms, they have to decay at infinity, okay? So maybe, that is... maybe I can also have a quick question. Sure. Uh, uh, so, so in the compact case, right? So harmonic forms uh, are the, the dimension is the same as the dimension of the Ram cohomology. So, so I would assume that fails here, but but still, do you get some information from the Singer conjecture about the Ram cohomology? Like, yes, and like we're going to see regular the... Betty numbers. Yes, we are going to see the connection in a second. Okay, good. That's yeah. That's a famous theorem of uh, Luke, and we're actually going to use it in the book. Okay, mm -hmm. but that, yeah, that's a very good point. Okay, so this is since this is uh, an informal seminar, let me, if there are students in the audience, let me give you a little bit of examples so that I'll convince you that the class of a spherical manifold is very interesting for geometric analysts. So, uh, for example, if I take MG uh, such that the sectional curvature are all non positive. Then we know that by Hadamard theorem, the uh, universal cover is actually diffeomorphic uh, to Rn. And so in particular, Mn is gonna be a quotient of this Rn by a group of isometries, okay? So, and then this guy is gonna be uh, co-compact inside the isometry group of this Rn equipped with the pullback metric uh, G tilde. Okay, and let me add torsion free. So we wanna get a manifold and co-compact. Okay, in particular, hyperbolic space is there. There are more examples which uh, do not come from a positive section of curvature. Other examples, uh, uh, for example, if I have an object like this, such that the universal cover is Rn, again, this is contractible and examples for example, uh, infra new manifolds or infra sub manifold. And those do not support a matrix uh, with a section of curvature less than zero. Okay, so for example, if you take the Eisenberg three-dimensional group, which is the upper triangular three by three matrices where you have all ones on the diagonal and you have uh, the, uh, um, and then you take the lattice where the non-zero entries are all integers that uh, the universal cover is the Eisenberg group, which is uh, the unique uh, non-abelian, potent, non-solvable uh, group and uh, that's a copy of R3. And if you take the compact quotients, are, I don't know, uh, non-trivial S1 bundles over tori, okay? Okay. Um, so if you never heard about the single conjecture, uh, let me add that, uh, first of all, it has a long history. Uh, it is of interest for many people, also outside geometric anal uh, analysis, uh, like, for example, if you do geometric group theory, uh, this is something that uh, those people are very interested in. And uh, uh, it has been studying a, lo a lot, but unfortunately, definitely results for this conjecture are kind of hard to uh, come by. One result that we have, which I don't know, I, maybe I labeled as fact zero, is that uh, Lot and Luke have shown in 1995 that the Singer conjecture holds true when the dimension is three. So in the case of uh, Riemann surfaces is a nice exercise to show that the conjecture is true. 
uh, and it holds them, it follows from the uniformization theorem. But, but that's kind of uh, an easy case. So let's go to the first non-trivial case. So the single conjecture holds true uh, when n is equal to three. And now there is a big if, if Tarston geometrization holds true. Also, okay. So uh, the approach which I'm gonna to present to you today uh, provides an alternative solution of the single conjecture in dimension three, but unfortunately does rely on Thurston geometrization uh, as well, okay? Uh, the nice thing about the approach that I'm gonna explain to you today is that it does generalize to large classes of manifold in higher dimension quite easily. Okay, but let me point out that uh, to give you an idea of how complicated this conjecture is, is that even in dimension three, at this time, there are no proof of the single conjecture which do not use the Tarston geometrization. Okay, so it's a quite, it's a tough one. So since I wanna use uh, Tarston geometrization, let me uh, summarize it this, uh, this result of Perman now is a, a theorem of Perman. What do we know after Perman? Well, we have a picture of three manifolds, which is uh, kind of similar uh, to the case of surfaces in many cases. So first of all, we know that if I start with an M3 closed as spherical, then I know that the universal cover is diffeomorphic to a tree. Now, this is not a trivial result because there are a spherical tree manifolds which are not diffeomorphic to a tree. The point is that they do not cover anything compact, okay? So, uh, and now once you know that M, the universal cover is diffeomorphic to a tree, in the language of three manifold theory, I know that M is the one in the base is irreducible, which means I recall you that if I take a two sphere inside M3, then this bounds a ball B3. So three bounds a B3 inside uh, M3, okay? Okay, so irreducible, and then Thurston tells you that any irreducible tree manifold can be split along tori, and each piece that you get is a geometric manifold. So moreover, so I'm gonna draw for you hopefully an interesting picture. Moreover, for any uh, irreducible uh, M3, there exists a collection of finite disjoint embedded tori, tori say, I don't know, uh, T1 up to TK in M3, such that each component of M cut along the union of this tori, cut along the union of the K is geometric. Now let me define what geometric means, i.e. it admits a complete finite volume metric uh, modeled on one of the a Thurston geometries model on one of the Thurston geometries. So let's see if I remember them. So the most common one is the hyperbolic one. Then you have the Euclidean one, then the spherical, which is not very important for in the case of a spherical things, but then I have SL2R. So SL2R is a nice three manifold. Uh, if you put a left invariant metric, you get a nice uh, complete three manifold, take the universal cover. 
Uh, then I have the NIL manifold, uh, which was the uh, Heisenberg group. Then you can take the solve. Now there are a ton of solvable uh, three-dimensional groups, but only one admits uh, compact quotients. And so you get that one. And then uh, what else is left? I am a two, four, six, and then I have the products, the products of geometries. So something that looks like a hyperbolic Riemann surface cross R and then a spherical uh, S2 cross R, okay? Now, when I say modeled, uh, let me try to be not too sloppy here. Uh, so this means uh, locally isometric, okay? Okay, so I guess I'll give you a picture. So if you take, then uh, for us, we are interested in a spherical manifold. So what, what we're gonna have is maybe you have a finite volume hyperbolic manifold. You know that this object is a manifold of finite topological type with finitely many cusps. And those cusps uh, uh, in the orientable case have tori cross section. So let's say this blue manifold here is uh, a quotient of H3R. And then you can glue in uh, some pieces, other geometric pieces. And for us really, especially if you require the uh, splitting tori to be essential in P1, this is gonna be in most cases, H2R cross R, okay? So each of the right piece what you have to have in mind is a punctual Riemann surface where you truncate the cusp and you take a product with an S1, then you get a boundary which is an S2 and you glue that boundary S2 to the boundary of the uh, cusp of the hyperbolic three manifold which you chopped, okay? So this is a you know, this is a great theorem because it's a really a structured theorem of any three manifold. So given any three manifold, now we know that you can split it this way. Okay, are there any questions? No, no, okay. Um, okay, so as I said, um, the proof I'm gonna present you today, it relies on certain uh, geometric inequalities for harmonic forms, which have been, uh, developing with Mark Stern since 2017. Now, uh, I have limited time, so I'm just gonna give you in a nutshell uh, what we can prove in the three-dimensional case. And so I would say uh, the theory of price inequalities uh, for harmonic forms Uh, in a nutshell, okay? So now for the one of you in the audience which are pure uh, geometric analysts, here is the old geometric analysis is condensed here in the sense that uh, there are a lot of integration by parts, are geometric integrations. So curvature plays a very important role. And moreover, uh, the Moser iteration arguments uh, for harmonic forms uh, does play an important role. In particular, the key aspect of the, this geometric and, uh, analytical argument is the, is the fact that you can bound the L infinity norm or harmonic uh, eight form in terms of uh, the L2 energy of this harmonic form in a ball, okay? <clears throat> but anyway, I, if I had to present to this theory, it will take just one seminar by itself. So I'm just gonna condense it and uh, I'm gonna tell you what kind of inequalities I can get by this theory without providing, of course, a proof, okay? But if you are interested, I, we can talk at the end of the, of the seminar and I can refer you to the uh, relevant um, uh, literature. One interesting thing is that uh, I think some of you study Young Mills theory, some in the audience. So the price inequalities uh, were uh, are extremely well known for people studying Young Mills theory. Uh, apparently, this idea was never applied to other harmonic sections of other bundles. And so, what we have done is to develop this theory systematically in the case of harmonic K forms on a manifold. Okay. But definitely, if you 
work in Young Mills theory, you have seen some form of price inequality in that context already. Okay, so what wasn't developed uh, it was the case of um, harmonic K forms. Okay, uh, so let me just give you a nutshell of this theory. Uh, so in the three dimensional case, what you can produce is the following. If I give you a closed M3G, and now I'm gonna assume from now on that the injectivity radius is bounded below by a constant epsilon naught, which is fixed. And moreover, I'm gonna assume that the sectional curvature in absolute value is less or equal than one. Then what you can do by using the Hodge theorem, as Damash was uh, mentioning before, you can express the B1 as an integral over M3 of, let me call it a density, a, a B1 density, which is gonna be a smooth, uh, a non-negative non function over uh, your manifold. And uh, I'm gonna tell you in a second how you do that. So this is gonna be, let me call it for the sake of this talk, this is a density function. Uh, for B1, so in particular, uh, it's gonna be uh, bigger or equal than zero at all points, and moreover has only isolated singularities. Singularities. So how can you do that? Well, uh, you know that the space of harmonic K forms, the dimension of it uh, computes the uh, Betty number. So you can take, uh, K, you know, if the B1 is K, you can take K uh, linear independent harmonic one form and you can normalize uh, their, their, their L2 energy to B1. And then if you integrate their sum over B1, you get the Betty number. Now, the interesting part, which uses all these uh, price inequalities ideas and Moser iteration, is that one can say the following, that there exists a C1 bigger than zero. This C1 is gonna depend on the lower bound of injectivity radius and on the bound of sectional curvature, uh, such that, well, this density function, which in this case is the uh, B1 density function, is bounded from above by C1 for any uh, X in M, so let me call this one. This is just gonna be one of the two ingredients I'm gonna uh, use in the proof. And then two, uh, what else can I say? Well, if X inside M3 is such that a ball of radius, the injectivity radius at X of this ball centered at X is isometric uh, to a ball inside the hyperbolic tree space with the hyperbolic metric where sectional curvature is normalized to be minus one, then there is a very nice upper bound on this density function that goes as one over the injectivity radius, okay? So here is the uh, main content of the price inequality uh, in the hyperbolic case. And now here again for some positive C2, and this C2, once again, the important thing is that it depends only on epsilon naught and on the bound of the sectional curvature. And so let's call this fact two. So what I wanna show to you is that by using uh, just these two facts plus geometrization, one can prove the single conjecture in dimension three, therefore recovering uh, there will no result of lot and look. Are there any questions? Uh, so, so in the beginning of your slide, you mentioned that uh, B1, the Betty number, is integral of some function. So, Sorry, so, say, say it again. Uh, so in the beginning of the slide, you mentioned that yeah. the first Betty number is integral of some function. Yes, and I okay. told you how to get that function. Yeah. So, so the, you use the Arch theorem, you know, yeah. Right. So, so similar statement will be true for higher Betty numbers as well, right? Yes. That, that is correct. So okay. uh, we have similar estimates for any beta numbers. For example, if you are in higher dimensions, uh, now what it does change is that the, the first estimate is the same 
in any dimension. The second estimate might be different. For example, if okay. you are if if you are in the four dimensional case and you have a ball of injectivity radius which is isometric, blah blah blah, then in that case the upper bound is better. It's gonna be exponential in the injectivity radius. So yes, this theory of price inequality that we have developed systematically, uh, first of all, uh, the constants and the uh, and the upper bounds depends on which ge geometry you are talking about. In the case of hyperbolic geometry, you have certain exponential decay, or in this case, one over injectivity radius. If you're doing complex hyperbolic geometry, then you get always exponential decay. Then if you have metrics with pinch sectional curvature, then you have exponential decays that might be a little bit weaker, but that's the, that's the idea. But you're completely right. This theory works uh, for any beta numbers, now, I'm not going to talk very much about it, but if the key is always to get a bound here on the right hand side with decays on the injectivity, which decays with the injectivity radius. If we could do that for any metric with just no positive sectional curvature, then we will have, uh, you know, part of the single conjecture, but that is, again, uh, unproven at the moment, okay? So I have to say, this can be done always in any dimension for any Betty number, but you don't always have some uh, very useful upper bounding too. With that said, for hyperbolic, for metric to pinch sectional curvature, for complex hyperbolic, you have all of these things. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, so now I can finally talk about, uh, answer the question of Tamash. So what is the connection with the regular Betty numbers? And I actually am gonna use this in my proof. So the way I wanna show this conjecture here is by using another fact. So now let me, this fact is a summary of two results, uh, one by Luke and one by Hempel. So it goes as follows. Let's say I, I give you a closed spherical three manifold Then Hempel show in the 70s that uh, the pi one on M3 is residually finite for simplicity RF, I think I'm gonna use it uh, more later. So now what does this mean? That is, uh, there exists a sequence uh, gamma K of nested uh, subgroups uh, in gamma, which is just gonna be the pi one of my three manifold, uh, such that, well, gamma K is normal in gamma and the index of gamma K inside gamma is finite. And then if I take the intersection of all this nested subgroup, I get the identity, okay? So moreover, a result of Luke tells you that whenever you have a manifold, which is a spherical, was a fundamental group is residually finite, then you can compute the L2 Betty numbers defined by idea with this uh, functional theoretical uh, arguments as the phenomenon dimension of the gamma module given by the Hilbert space of high dimensional L2 harmonic forms, just in terms of the regular Betty numbers, okay? Moreover, we have, and this is a famous result of Luke, that if I take the limit as k goes to infinity of bi of mk, uh, the degree of pi k, this is equal to bi2 of m. And now I have to explain who pi k is, where pi k is the regular cover associated to the normal subgroup of finite index gamma k. Is the regular cover associated to uh, gamma k, okay? So here I can then finally formalize the connection between the regular Betty numbers and the L2 Betty numbers. So the L2 Betty number encodes the asymptotic growth of cohomology or homology in this case of towers of the given manifold, okay? 
Sound good, Tamash? You're good. Yeah? You're good. So I don't know if this is what you were thinking about, but you know, you have this manifold, which has a huge fundamental group. So it has a lot of colors. Then you take colors that converge to the universal color. And you take the Betty number of the cover, you normalize by the degree of the cover, you take this limit, and then Luke tells you that, first of all, the limit exists, and this is not completely obvious. And second, that this magically computes these L2 Betty numbers defined in terms of L2 harmonic forms on the universal color. Okay? And so this is something which is of interest for many uh, mathematicians, a lot of geometric topologists, uh, they look at these kind of questions. And uh, interestingly enough, this is connected with L2 cohomology on the universal color, okay? So then you see that uh, if I wanna prove the single conjecture in dimension three, then I can do the following. So in order to prove Singer uh, for N equal to three, then it suffices to show that the limit in uh, three, sorry, uh, is zero for i equal to one, okay? Now notice that the cases uh, i equal to zero and three are trivial because the degree is going to infinity but the numerator is always zero, okay? Are trivial. And uh, if I have the case i equal to one, I can cover the case i equal to two by Poincare duality. So it can be covered uh, by Poincare duality. Okay? Well, this is kind of interesting that if I can control this limit, just in the case i equal to one, and I can show that this limit is going to be equal to zero, uh, then uh, I have the single conjecture in dimension three. Now, similarly, if you go in higher dimension, in that case, you have to work with more indices, uh, but a similar strategy would apply. So as long as you have an aspherical manifold, which has dimension n, residually fund and uh, a fundamental group, which is residually finite, then by studying the asymptotic growth of cohomology or homology, you might be able to show the single conjecture. Okay. With that said, it's very hard. Okay. So this is not a trivial uh, problem at all. In fact, it has been open for many decades. So are there any questions uh, regarding the strategy that we are going to follow? No? It's clear? Okay. Okay. Now, um, I have a little bit more than 15 minutes. Uh, I'm going to work out an example, which uh, hopefully uh, you'll find interesting. And this is an example where the geometric trim manifold, which you're looking at, has two geometric pieces, and those pieces are all real hyperbolic. So now one thing that uh, you, you'll have to take my word for it is that Manifolds which have hyperbolic pieces are the hardest to uh, study for the, from the single conjecture point of view. So if you had, for example, a graph manifold, well, all those pieces, you didn't have any piece which was hyperbolic and it was a spherical, then the vanishing of the L2 Betty numbers is relatively easy to accomplish. So the following example, which we're gonna discuss, uh, at first sight might look like just, okay, you're solving this, this conjecture this example, but it's actually the, it encodes all of the possible difficulties that you want you are going to encounter when trying to solve this problem in dimension three in full generality. So I would like to start now with. Um, so we have seen that if you have a hyperbolic piece in the Thurston geometrization, then <clears throat> that piece is uh, diffeomorphic to a finite volume hyperbolic manifold with the cusp truncated. So you're going to have we're gonna start with a hyperbolic uh, three manifold of finite volume. And for simplicity, I'm also gonna assume that we have only one cusp. 
So now the argument that we're going to do on the cusp are blueing arguments. And so you will see that once you know how to do it on one cusp, nothing is blocking you from repeating this uh, uh, for more general hyperbolic tree manifold, which possibly have more than one cusp. So if you have just one cusp, your object looks like this. And uh, uh, moreover, it has uh, torus cusps, uh, something like this. So also you have a uh, parameter S, which tells you how deep in the cusp you are. Now, let's say if I consider the cross section, cross -section of the cusp at, uh, for the value of the parameter S equal to zero, then I get a certain uh, two-dimensional tori. This torus here, which is smaller, let's call it TS. And so I have that a cusp is always going to be diffeomorphic to um, a half a line cross T2. And moreover, the minus one hyperbolic metric has a, has a very nice form. So you can actually write it down explicitly. And this is going to be uh, ds squared minus e uh, plus e to the minus 2s g on t2. Now, the metric on t2 is a flat metric. So this is flat metric on t2. OK? So now, how can we construct a closed three manifold out of it? So if you remember the picture I've, done, I've given you for you at the beginning, what you do in the geometric decomposition of Thurston, uh, you chop the cusp here, and then uh, you want to try to double this manifold. Now, you can double this manifold by uh, gluing the boundary tori with a fine diffeomorphism. So let me just give you a few examples. So first of all, uh, given n, I'm going to say that n bar is the uh, manifold with boundary obtained by trun truncating the cusp. Okay. And then if I want to construct a closely manifold out of it, well, I can do some things like this. So let, let's say that T naught is R2 modulo the integers. Then I can consider maybe the identity from uh, T naught to itself. And I can double the manifold and I get a close three manifold M, which is uh, the manifold which I obtained by uh, gluing the boundaries of N uh, bar uh, via the identity. And this is sometimes called the double of N. On the other hand, maybe I can, I can consider a of diffeomorphism of T2. So let's say I consider the matrix 2, 1, 1, 1. This matrix does preserve the integer points in Z2 and gives you an anus of diffeomorphism of T naught to itself. And then maybe I can glue the boundaries in a more complicated way. So I can get another three manifold M, which is obtained by taking uh, N and, and N bar and N bar, two copies of N bar, and gluing them together by is an of diffeomorphism. Okay. <clears throat> so both uh, those examples uh, are aspherical and uh, uh, they admit a geometric decomposition with two pieces. Those two pieces are hyperbolic. And in the case that I'm doing here, where we have just one cusp, then we have just one uh, tori where we have to cut. Now, since I'm talking uh, at the University of Maryland, let me show you that one of the good students uh, from Maryland, uh, Bernard Lieb, studied those kind of manifolds in, uh, in his uh, University of Maryland 1992 thesis, I guess. And he also showed that, for example, both those two examples which are presented here, uh, they actually admit metrics with uh, non-positive sectional curvature. In the case, in the first case, it's trivial. In the second case, it's not completely trivial. And moreover, those manifolds are, they have geometric rank one in the sense of Bauman, Breen, and Eberlein. So I guess Breen is retired from uh, your department now, but uh, so those manifolds have geometric rank one. So in many ways, they resemble hyperbolic uh, manifolds, which also have rank one. 
but anyway, this is just an aside uh, remark. Okay. So let's say I have this object now. I want to construct a sequence of metric in the spirit of Shigel Gromov, and I will, I will add also Pugaya, which uh, does certain things for me. So next, once I have this smooth three manifold, which I obtain this way, I want to consider a sequence of metric. So next, uh, I want to construct a sequence of metrics uh, GN on, let's take the more complicated example because otherwise the double is too easy to see uh, as follows. So I have this manifold the cusp here and then I have this another copy on the other side. And what I wanna do is I construct a manifold, a metric, sorry, as follows. So here I have somehow to glue the boundary to I in a uh, non-trivial way. So this is where the anos of diffeomorphism act. So if you recall, so as, at this at this height we have the t zero. So this is the uh, cusp parameter s. Then I'm going to, uh, I don't know, stop here. This is n, this is n plus one, and this is n plus two. So, and here I have the cross section Tn. So first of all, what I can do is I can make the warping factor in the hyperbolic metric going to constant. And so in this, transition regime here, I can keep the sectional curvature Gn to be less or equal than zero. Here, I keep the warping factor constant. So actually in this case, I have in this region here, I have the sectional curvature uh, identically equal to zero. And then I perform my gluing. So that gluing, uh, <clears throat> what I claim for you is that you can do that gluing by keeping the sectional curvature bounded between minus one and one. So such that I'm gonna say a few words so that uh, you believe me. And uh, if you need more, maybe I can, I can go through the example in detail. So I wanna keep the sectional curvature uh, bounded by one in absolute value. And I also want that the limit as n goes to infinity uh, the volume of Gn of my manifold here, what am I recovering is just the volume of the two original finite volume hyperbolic manifold, which I truncated them then double. And so this is two ball uh, G minus one of M, okay? So what is the metric structure of the gluing? So imagine you have a cylinder, which is a torus cross an interval, and then you take the two boundary tori and you glue them by arms of diffeomorphism. What you get is a non-trivial T2 bundle over S1, okay? In the case where the, the gluing map is arms of, you actually get uh, the solvable geometry, okay? So in that case, you get something which is modeled on an R3, uh, modular lattice, uh, co-compact and torsion-free, which acts by isometries on, on the solvable geometry, okay? In that case, the metric, the, the, the modern metric is just a left invariant metric there, and the rescaling, because in this case, what is happening is that the fibers are actually collapsing. You're making the fibers smaller and smaller, but they are still claiming that you can keep the sectional curvature bounded. And this is an easy exercise in the manual geometry, because if you take the solvable three-dimensional geometry, and uh, uh, you rescale uh, the fibers will correspond to the uh, a normal subgroup inside sol, which is uh, <clears throat> which is just a copy of R two, and you rescale the fat metric on R two, and you get a one-parameter family of uh, left invariant metric, which are actually collapsing to the interval or to the S1 with bounded geometry, okay? So the gluing can actually be done and uh, uh, 
if you want, I can be more explicit, but it just, uh, it's a computation with uh, left invariant metrics on um, the solved geometry, okay? <clears throat> now, let me uh, remark that the same construction holds true in higher dimension. And here I have to, to cite some certain name. So Chiger, Gromov, uh, Fukaya, Farrell, Jones. So they're all a, a Stony Book at one point. <laughs> so and notice that this is not a, contri a, a completely trivial matter because what you can do in higher dimension, imagine you do the same thing with a nine dimensional hyperbolic manifold and truncated cusp, and then I glue the boundary to I by an affine diffeomorphism. But then let's say I glue an exotic spheres on the neck, the resulting manifold will not admit a sequence of metrics like this, okay? So when I say the same hold true for N bigger or equal than three, this is always if the affine diffeomorph if the diffeomorphism of the boundary are affine, okay? The same holds true in n bigger or equal than three, let me put it in red. If the diffeomorphisms are, are fine, okay, it doesn't always hold true. And I can tell you more about that uh, business of uh, summing up exotic spheres. Okay, it's very interesting, and it's due to Farrell and Jones. Okay, so I'm ready. Uh, to go ahead with the proof. So let me define the following uh, disconnected subset of M. So I'm gonna define MN to be the following subset of my manifold M, which is uh, disconnected. So I chop the part where the gluing is happening and actually I chop it uh, at, so if this is the cusp parameter, S, I cusp it, uh, I chop it at N equal to, uh, S equal to N over two and same, same story here. This is at N equal to two. So this is a disconnected subset. So disconnected inside M. And moreover by construction, I know that uh, the volume with respect to GM the sequence of metrics, which I put on my geometric manifold following Shiger and Gromov. Uh, this is the volume of GN of M minus a little piece and epsilon N goes to zero as N goes to infinity, uh, where limit as N goes to infinity of epsilon N is equal to zero. Okay, so basically this, this disconnected part is, it, it contains most of the volume, it's the thick part, okay? So now what I do is take, and I hope it's okay if I use just two more minutes. So take uh, gamma K, uh, a sequence of subgroups uh, of gamma equal to pi one of M, as in the definition of residual definiteness, as in the definition of residual definiteness. And what I do is the following for fixed n bigger than one, define the Riemannian covers, which I denote by m with the index k up, which is not the dimension, the dimension is always three. And then I have mk, I have this cover pi k, which is the regular cover associated to that uh, sub normal subgroup. But now here I consider the metric, which is just the pullback metric of the metric GN on the base manifold. So where GNK is defined to be pi K star of GN, okay? So in other words, this is the uh, Riemannian cover associated to that uh, subgroup. And finally, I have to define one more subset of MK. So finally, uh, let's define M K N 
to be the pullback by the covering map of this disconnect set inside MK. Okay, so the picture is that you have your manifold at the base, you take this uh, cover, and this cover is uh, it's thicker. If you look on the cusp, you are unraveling the cusp, okay? Okay, so in particular, I claim that uh, by studying the sequence MK, G, and K converging to the Riemannian universal cover uh, M tilde with uh, G M tilde metric, where G M tilde is the pullback of G M. Then we can show the following. Uh, we see that there exists a K naught, which depends on N such that uh, for any K bigger or equal than K naught and any P inside M and K, there exists a ball center of P of radius N divided by two isometric to a ball inside the hyperbolic tree space. Isometric to a ball in H3 R G minus one. Okay, and now it's really the, the, the last estimate. So what's happening here is that the manifold downstairs might be collapsing, but it's collapsing with bounded covering geometry, okay? And here, as you go deeper and deeper in the tower, you're really converging to the universal cover, which is non-collapsed, okay? And moreover, bigger and bigger pieces of this universal color, the biggest part is hyperbolic, okay? So as long as you stay far from the gluing region, what you are seeing as you converge to universal color is bigger and bigger balls of the uh, hyperbolic tree space. Okay, so now I can do the final estimates and I show you that uh, B1 uh, divided by the degree of the cover goes to zero. So I promise this is just one slide. So if I wanna compute B1 of MK, then this is what? The integral of MK of the density, G and K. And now I can do the integral over the N and K part of B1 of X, the mu G and K plus uh, the complement. Okay, nothing deep here. But now I can use price, okay? And so this is less than two C1 uh, divided by N, the volume of G and K, M and K plus C2, uh, the volume of G and K of the complement. Okay, so that if I take the normalized uh, Betty number, so if I take B1 and I divide it by the volume, what do I get? Well, I get 2C1 divided by N plus C2. Now, these are Riemannian covers, so the, uh, that volume is nothing else than the degree of the cover times the volume of G with respect to Gn of M minus Mn, which we know is small. And then I divide by the degree of pi K vol of Gn of M. So in other words, this is 2C1 divided by N plus a C2, epsilon of n divided by volume of g n m. But now as n goes to infinity, the volume of g n of m is converging to twice the hyperbolic volume of the hyperbolic pieces. So this is approximately for n large uh, plus c2 epsilon m divided by two volume of the pieces. And this is as the volume of Gn of M goes to twice the volume of G minus one of N. N was the finite volume hyperbolic manifold, which we double. And so then basically I'm done. Thus, 
for fixed n, if I take the limb soup as k goes to infinity of b1 mk divided by the volume of g and k mk, this is nothing else than the limb soup with respect to k of b1 mk divided by now the degree. And this is what I want in order to use a Luke approximation theorem, volume of g and m. And this is less or equal than now another constant c1 prime divided by n plus c2 prime epsilon n. And then taking n that goes to infinity, I get the result. Uh, I obtain that the lean soup as k goes to infinity of b1 mk divided by the degree is zero. And I'll close here. Questions. If there are no questions, I think I can close up here. I think I ran uh, five minutes over time, but we started probably five minutes later. Yes, yes, you're fine, don't worry. Yeah. Are there, so are there any questions in addition to the ones we had during the lecture? If not, then let's thank uh, Luca with our, our virtual round of applause. All right, thanks a lot, thanks a lot. Thank you.